Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of October 23rd, 2023. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, in response to those who claim it's the PFD at fault for the current earnings reserve problem, we do a side-by-side -side comparison of the payments made out of the earnings reserve for statutory inflation proofing and the statutory PFD over the past seven years. Second, we look at how changes in the labor force are undermining the argument that government spending is needed to create jobs. And third, we take issue with DNR's proposal to issue net profits leases in the Cook Inlet. And now, let's join Michael. Mr. Keithley, uh, welcome to the program and thanks for coming in. Brad Keithley, of course, with Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, an organization dedicated to try and bring us back from the fiscal brink of insanity. And uh, he's got uh, three big topics that uh, he wants to talk about today. Number one, Brad, which is, I had to laugh because it is, it, this seems to be the new prevalent belief that somehow, some way, it was the PFD that's causing the ERA problem, the earnings reserve account problem, the lack of state funding. It's the P, has nothing to do with anything else. It's always just the PFD. Give me the, give me the rundown here. Well, Michael, that uh, the Permanent Fund Board's proposal to merge the earnings reserve account with the Permanent Fund Corpus essentially eliminating the earnings reserve and start taking draws against that against that combined account continues to trouble me for, for a number of reasons. I wrote a column on it uh, last week. Uh, my last Friday column in the landmine was was on that subject and showed how that proposal uh, under certain conditions could drain the PFD or drain the permanent fund. Uh, indeed, uh, by 2050, drain it entirely under certain conditions. So um, I, I keep thinking about it different ways. The, 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 the theme, as you just mentioned, that it's the PFD that's causing the problem um, is instead of, instead of other things, uh, led me to dig into it another way. And I did a, I did a chart uh, on it and did some analysis on it over the weekend. That'll be the subject of the column I have uh, this coming Friday in the landmine. But I wanted to preview it a little bit uh, here on the show. Um, so I looked at uh, at, at two at, at the earnings um, at the earnings reserve the the use of the earnings reserve from two standpoints one how much had gone to the inflation proofing and the other at how much how much had gone to the PFD both of those statutes both the inflation both the inflation proofing payment and the permanent fund dividend are statutes are provided by statutes they're provided in the same section. Uh, the Alaska Code, they are parallel, uh, essentially, in their operation. The, the instructions to the legislature or the instructions uh, of how you administer those are the same. You're supposed to draw a certain amount for, the, for inflation proofing, and you're supposed to draw a certain amount for, uh, for the PFD. And uh, they're supposed, both supposed to come from the earnings reserve account, and that's how the, that's how the statute's set up to operate. So I looked at, since 2017, since the legislature started uh, uh, cutting the PFD, underfunding the PFD, uh, I, I looked at how those two statutes have been treated, and and the results even surprised me a little bit. I hadn't I hadn't really thought through all this before, uh, 
uh, all of the inflation proofing side before. And so when I ran these numbers and started putting numbers to paper, uh, the results uh, surprised me. Over, the, over that period from 2017 through 2023, the statutory inflation proofing payments should have been $10 billion. Or, yeah, $10 billion. That's, what's the, that's what the, um, uh, the statutes provided for. If you apply the statute, the uh, statute related to inflation proofing, that's what it says. Uh, that the that the total amount, calculating the numbers, the total amount should have been $10 billion. The total amount that should have gone to the to the PFD over that same period is $13.79 billion. Uh, $13.8 billion. Okay, so those are the statutory, those are the statutory amounts that that should have been paid. On the inflation proofing side of the $10 billion uh, that should have gone, that should have been paid out of the earnings reserve to the to the inflation proofing. The legislature actually paid out fourteen billion dollars, about yeah. about, about well, four four billion dollars more uh, than than provided by uh, than required by the statute, and they did that. If, if you've got the chart, we can throw it up while I'm while I'm explaining it. If, if yeah, they, let me pull it up. It, they did that by two four billion dollar ad hoc draws from the earnings reserve, one in FY twenty. And the other in FY22, they did that by two ad hoc draws, uh, $4 billion each, $8 billion. Um, and that uh, has resulted in overpaying the inflation proofing during that period uh, by uh, $4 billion. On the statutory PFD side, on the PFD side, uh, the amount that should have been paid is, thir- is $13.8 billion. Of that, the legislature's only paid $7 billion underpaying the statutory PD, PFD by $6.75 billion. That's money that should have been pulled from the earnings reserve to go to the PF, to go to the, to the permanent fund dividend that didn't get pulled. They got left in the earnings reserve. And that's, that's the same amount that got pulled over to government instead, got taxed out of the PFD and got paid out of government. So government was overpaid by $6.75, $6.75 billion. Uh, from the earnings reserve account. Inflation proofing was overpaid by $3.86 billion, $4 billion um, uh, uh, from, the, from the account. And there we go. That's, that's the chart. Um, so, the, so the amount on the inflation proofing is on the left-hand side, the $10 billion that should have gone to the statutory PFD over the years 2017 to 2023 is in the left-hand column the amount appropriated annually, and then those two ad hoc draws, special special uh, charges to the ERA, uh, are uh, for the for the inflation proofing or, or in the next two columns. And the total is thirteen point nine billion dollars, fourteen billion dollars, an overpayment of uh, of three point nine billion dollars, thirty uh, thirty eight percent overpayment, uh, overpull from the ERA. Uh, for inflation proofing over over that period of time, and then the PFDs on the right hand side, the statutory amounts that should have gone to the PFD thirteen point eight billion dollars, the amount that was appropriated, the single ad hoc uh, addition to it, the the energy uh, rebate uh, in FY twenty three of four hundred twenty million dollars, total of, of seven billion dollars has gone to the PFD, an underpayment to the PFD of six point seven five billion dollars. Uh, an underpayment of roughly 50%, roughly 50% of the statutory uh, PFD uh, has been has been paid over that period. So you look at those numbers and you sit there going, okay, what's what's the what's the reason for what's going on with the ERA? If, if the ERA is being overdrawn, and this is the this is the permanent fund board's story uh, that the ERA is being overdrawn and that uh, it's in danger of running out of funds. And as a result, now we need to consolidate it with the permanent fund corpus so we can take the draw from, from the two combined amounts. If the if the ERA is over, being overdrawn such that we have this problem, what's causing it? Well, it sure as heck isn't the, isn't the PFD, which has been underpaid uh, by $6.75 billion uh, from 2017 through 2023, uh, underpaid by roughly 50%. It's the it's the inflation it's it's the amount that went to government uh, that six point seven five that went to government plus that overpayment that went to government plus the four billion dollars the roughly four billion dollars three point eight six billion dollars 
that's been overpaid to inflation proofing during that period. Inflation proofing isn't in danger. Inflation proofing has a $3.86 billion surplus uh, over that period. So um, it's the whole narrative that's going on here is uh, is Trump from the permanent fund board is is hugely troubling. I mean, the narrative right. is, look, we've got a problem. The problem is being caused by by we got a problem with inflation proofing. We got a problem with a with a fund not getting all the money it need all the, all the money to which it's entitled. We got to change it. We got to change the whole process uh, in order to in order to deal with this problem. Well, the problem isn't there. The, the problem they they've already overpaid it by four billion dollars. So the problem isn't there. The problem the problem the and problem it, is yeah. they've they've overdrawn for inflation proofing. Well, and that's in black and white. And of course, that doesn't even factor in the the POMV formula is supposed to have a component baked into it to prevent that. To, even if you even if you didn't do additional inflation proofing, one of the selling points of SB 26 back in the day was that it would take care of that. So, I mean, this 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 whole thing is smoke and mirrors. Like I said, it's a it's an artificial crisis created to give them an opportunity to attach themselves directly to the corpus of the fund. Yep. And, and it's, it's a, it's a, I mean, this is stuff, this is stuff. Once you sit down, you go through the numbers, this is stuff that, that comes right out of uh, the permanent fund, uh, permanent funds own uh, annual reports and their periodic uh, uh, updates that they do to those annual reports, their annual, uh, their history and projections, uh, stuff that's available directly from the permanent fund. This is, this is stuff that the press could easily have gotten their hands on, could easily have walked through, could easily have right. put together, could easily have analyzed uh, as part of, of testing the credibility, if you will, of the statements being made by the by the permanent fund board. But rather than do that, all they're doing is they're just taking the permanent fund board statements at face value without without testing their credibility and repeating those in the press and creating this sense of this sense of crisis out there that is just just wrong. Well, and now you've done all the work for him. James Brooks should be thanking you and going out there and and putting this uh, putting this chart out there. I mean, come on, this is again a thirty eight, almost thirty nine percent overpayment in inflation proving and a nearly fifty percent underpayment of the permanent fund. That should be headline news. Quite honestly, I mean, that should be something that somebody should be going, "Hey, look at this." And they're both statutes, Michael. I mean, we hear a lot about, oh, statutes don't mean anything for fiscal matters. You know, the legislature can do whatever it, want, it wants. Well, okay, if you're going to start doing whatever you want, you at least should treat the similarly situated statutes the same. You shouldn't be giving a preference to one statute over and, and ignoring, and ignoring, another, ignoring another statute. And these two statutes set side by side in the same section or subsections of the same section uh, in, in Alaska code. And what they're doing is overpaying one uh, statute and underpaying uh, the other statute. And it's just, I, it, it, it's sort of, I mean, the, the, the more you dig into this, the more you think about, you know, testing the credibility of what the Permanent Fund Board and Bert and others are saying, the more you think about it and the more you test the credibility, the more the story just evaporates Fact, right. the story the story reverses. It's not it's not the permanent funds fault, not the permanent fund dividends fault that uh, that that the ERA is in trouble. It's it's these overpayments, specifically those two four billion dollar uh, uh, ad hoc payments uh, that have that have drained the permanent fund down. Yeah, the, we did another. If anybody's interested, we did we do uh, monthly charts um, looking at the information in the permanent fund publishes on a monthly basis once they publish the, the monthly updates to their financial statements. And that those will be coming out this morning. The, the, the permanent fund released that information yesterday. We did the analysis last night. Those charts will be coming out this morning. And it'll show again that the way the permanent fund is calculating the earnings reserve account and, and minimizing the level of the earnings reserve account just, just doesn't hold water. I mean, right. <laughs> They're, they're throwing in all sorts. They're throwing in, you know, all sorts of adjustments and and reserves for future for future uh, draws to 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 press that press that amount down. But once you adjust for all those, 
the earnings reserve has something like $12 billion of spendable money in it. So, right. uh, so the question becomes then you've got two choices here. Either this is intentional or it's hubris of saying, we know better than you how this money should be spent, essentially, when it's all said and done. I mean, essentially, Brad, that's the thing. This is either completely intentional or it is hubris and arrogance of, oh, well, we just know better than you. And so we're going to bamboozle you for your own good, essentially. We're going to do all this stuff to show you this so that we can put this money away for the future. That's kind of that, that's kind of how I uh, how I look at this. They're trying they're trying to create a case for constitutionalizing one of the statutes, the inflation proofing statute and not constitutionalizing the other, the permanent fund statute. And the narrative that they've come up with is, oh, the permanent funds over, it, the permanent funds causing all these, the permanent fund dividends causing all these problems, and and so we need to we need to you know ignore it, and we need to constitutionalize the inflation proofing because that's the good use uh, of 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 the money, and and you know and and the the argument is, look, it's all about future Alaskans. Well, <laughs> guess what? You're overpaying future Alaskans at the expense of current Alaskans. I get that you want to protect future Alaskans, but you're overpaying into the account that protects future Alaskans and you're, and you're underpaying, you're taking it out of the hides of, of, of current Alaskans, particularly specifically uh, middle and lower income Alaska families. So it's, it's, I mean, there's just, there's just, it, it, it's a, they're, they're, they want to get a narrative and they're, and they're creating, they're creating this narrative, but the facts don't, when you, when you test the credibility of the narrative, the facts just don't support the numbers. The permanent fund, permanent funds own numbers don't support uh, the narrative. And I, you know, last week I talked about, I, I think this, I, this builds a case. This adds to the case for sunsetting the current permanent fund board because it's become too politicized and, and, and right. reestablishing a new permanent fund board, a much more professional, much less politicized permanent fund board. Uh, going forward. I kept that theme going for those that want to, you know, see how that sort of plays out. I kept that theme going uh, in the column I did last week uh, for the landmine. Um, and I'm going to keep it going, you know, for, I, I just don't trust them anymore. I mean, they're, they're manipulating numbers to fit yeah. a narrative, manipulating numbers yeah. to fit a narrative. Well, when you take, and just to break it down for the simple folks like me in the back, when you say, here's how much we have in the account now, and here's what our current spend is. Oh, by the way, here's what our future spend is without putting in the future deposits. That's like saying, if you keep paying your rent, you know, with what you have in your account right now, you're going to be out of money in three months, not counting the fact that your paycheck is going to go into the account every month for the next three months. That's essentially what they're doing, right? I mean, am I simplifying that well enough? Yeah, you are. You are. It's exactly right. They're, 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 in the in the reports they do these monthly reports of the status of the of the accounts, that's exactly what they're doing with the ERA. They're they're taking out a full year's they're taking out a full year's uh, 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 expenditure POMV draw, and then they're taking out next year's. It's not just it's, it's not just not just a full year of this. Year. Well, so it's three months of revenue currently. It's three months of revenue, a full and then and then and then and then offset against that a full year's POMV draw. And then they add in next year's inflation proofing. I guess they just didn't get it low enough. The first with the first adjustment, right. first misadjustment, they added in the second misadjustment. And it's just, I mean, not even LBNA buys that. LBNA, uh, Alexi wrote a note, one of LBNA's notes uh, uh, earlier this year says, you know, we don't, we don't account for uh, what's going on in the permanent fund the same way that the permanent fund board does that the permanent fund uh, is is publishing these numbers because they'd be thrown out of every accounting house in the country if they did it that way i mean essentially this is yeah. i mean this is all bs is essentially what it is they're trying to craft a narrative using these numbers and it's all just voodoo economics it's just all sorcery of saying we pick magical numbers out of the sky we don't account for deposits but we count for withdrawals and expenditures there you go I mean, that's the thing, right? Yep, that's that's a big piece of it. That's a big piece of it on these monthly numbers. Exactly yeah. right. All right, let's uh, get to this number two of the weekly top three. We keep hearing about how government 
oh, all these plans and projects and things that they want to do for job creation. Um, I'll just say it right out front here. Government doesn't create anything. Government is a net consumer. OK, that's just kind of how it all factors into the world. But they keep telling you how they need to be job creators. But it turns out <clears throat> they may not be the answer here because it may not be the problems that they think it is. Brad? Yeah, one of the one of the things that really bugs me uh, about political arguments, and this particularly comes up in the capital budget. Uh, when we go through the annual capital budget, but it also comes up when we talk about oil tax credits, uh, is it's important for the state to do these things in order to create jobs, that, uh, that we need a capital budget in order to create all these construction jobs. We need to, we need to have oil tax credits because we need all these North Slope, uh, we need all these North Slope jobs. And, and, and those, aren't, those aren't the only reasons they give, but, but those are a big part of the emotionalism that goes on behind, uh, behind, behind these arguments. It also shows up occasionally in the operating budget. It showed up in the statewide, uh, statewide budget as well when we were talking about a few years ago when we were talking about oil tax credits and eliminating oil tax credits. But, it's, but, but it, shows, it shows up mostly in the capital budget. It's, it's always about jobs, jobs, jobs. We need jobs. Government has to spend in order to in order to create these jobs, essentially taking money out of the pocket of, in the case of PFD cuts, when you're using PFD cuts as a marginal source, essentially taking pockets out of middle and lower income Alaska families and shifting them over to over to these jobs, over to the people who who get these jobs. It's a cross subsidy from one set of Alaskans uh, to a, to another set of Alaskans. Um, so, OK, I, I usually argue with those. and But, you know. People just sort of believe that we have to create these jobs. Government has to create these jobs. So we, we just have the argument. We sort of go in circles and then we go on to something else. There's an article um, that, that I think is important. And there's a shift going on that I think is hugely important uh, if, in a number of respects. But in respect to this argument in particular, um, and it's captured in a headline in a story in Alaska Public Media, I think it's. I think similar articles are also in other uh, in uh, the other publications. But the headline says, "Alaska labor forecast calls for continuing shortages in workers as boomers a as boomers age." And and basically the thrust of the article is, we just thought we thought all these job shortages, you know, not enough workers for the jobs that are posted out there. We thought that was, you know, for a while, we thought that was a temporary phenomena created by COVID and created by the comeback from COVID. We had all these, we had all these government support, support programs that had left a lot of dollars in people's pockets. Um, uh, and so they didn't have to immediately go back to work. And there were a variety of other COVID related reasons that were given for why there were labor shortages uh, in the economy coming out of COVID. This article uh, goes into uh, good coverage of an article that's in this this month's uh, labor trends that's put out by the Department of Labor, Alaska State Department of Labor, that says, you know, it, there's something else going on here, and it's much deeper. Right. And that and that is that as boomers age, as as the as the baby boomers are aging out of the workforce. As as you know, people reach sixty five or, or whatever age they they decide to retire as the baby baby boomers, which is this huge demographic bubble in in our in our population. As this as this as the baby boomers age out, go into retirement or otherwise are no longer in the workforce for whatever reason, um, there aren't enough people left in the other generations uh, to fill the jobs. It's not it's not COVID related, not necessarily COVID related. It's not necessarily the younger generation just doesn't know how to work. It's just there aren't enough people. Right. Um, Although COVID did add to that because it caused many of the baby boomers to retire early. Right. right? They right. reassessed their priorities and said, do I really want to participate in this madness or is now the time to pull the ripcord? And so many baby boomers retired early. Right. Right. And, and, and to that extent, it is COVID related, but it's more permanent than just once we get through COVID, everything goes back to where it was. It's these people are now gone. I mean, they, they may have left early or they... They may be leaving now, but they're gone. Um, and and so the question, yeah, you know, and so the 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 the, the worker force population is permanently shifting down as a result of the loss of the baby boomers. And and this article goes in to say, look, you know, this is this is a this is going to be a, a a new thing 
uh, that we're going to have worker shortages in the state of Alaska. There, I think there's one statistic in here that says there's two jobs for every worker. Yeah. Uh, two that's the jobs. one that blew my mind. And, and that's a directly inverse to what it was in the early 2000s where, where there was two jobs or two workers for every job. Now there's literally two jobs available for every working age person in the state. <laughs> In Alaska, this is not this yeah. is not a national number. This is this is focused on Alaska. So if that's the case, if that's the case, we don't. If we ever did, and I would argue we didn't, because we were creating cross subsidies. I mean, these jobs weren't free that the state was creating. They were coming out of somebody's pocket, and since 2017, they've been coming out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. If we ever if we ever needed government to be creating jobs, uh, that's gone. I mean, we, we, we now have too many jobs in the in the private workforce, uh, well, the private and public for, workforce combined. We have too many jobs for the number of workers we have out there. We don't need to be creating additional jobs on top of that because we're just exacerbating the problem. We're exacerbating the shortfall in workers in the in the uh, uh, in the in the private economy. We're, we're, we're creating the government instead of solving a problem of creating jobs for people would be creating an additional problem by taking people out, taking more people out of the, out of the private workforce uh, to stick them, uh, stick them to, to stick them into the government jobs. So I think this whole argument that we, that we hear regularly about, oh, it's important to create jobs, that we've got to have a capital budget to create jobs. We've got to have oil taxes to create oil tax credits in part to create jobs. We've got to have this program or that program in part to create jobs. I think that's gone. Um, and, and, and I think we've, we've got a, we now have to recognize that there's a sea change that's gone on in the workforce that, that eliminates the need for government to have job creating, if there ever was a need, argue there wasn't, but if there ever was a need, <laughs> has eliminated the need for government uh, job creation program. Right, because I, when, when do they succeed? When we hit three jobs to one person? I mean, you know, when is the success ratio at that point? And and again, I think Donna hits it hard. Ta Donna, uh, Donna Arduin makes the comment. She goes, that argument is almost as bad as saying adding more government regulations creates jobs, regulator jobs. I mean, that's exactly, is that what we want? We want more government jobs uh, of jobs that are then created and paid for by taxes in an ever in growing, growing bureaucracy? Or do we want more roads and things like that, where we've got crony capitalism, where we've talked about these companies building entire business models on government spend. Is that what we want? I mean, really? Yeah. Well, it, it, if there, there was a lot of debate that went on about that. A lot of good, a lot of arguments one way or the other. I won't say good arguments, but a lot of arguments one way or the other. But what I, my point is, that's all gone now. I mean, they're, they're creating, creating government jobs exacerbates, doesn't help a situation it exacerbates a situation of of having too many jobs out there for the number of employees and and if government creates jobs and and pulls people from you know from the workforce to fill the to 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 work in the already unfulfilled jobs to creates more jobs and pulls people out of that they're exacerbating the problem that already exists over in the private sector of not having enough people to work these jobs so it i think it changes the whole dynamic of this argument uh, uh, going forward, and, and in a way that, in a way that I really hadn't hadn't focused on until I read this article and then read the underlying uh, Alaska Labor, uh, uh, the the underlying magazine article um, in Labor Trends uh, that that supports the article. It's just we, we've got we've got a we've got a sea change that's happened. Uh, right. as, as the boomers, as the boomers exit the workforce, we've got a sea change that's happened and we need to recognize that. Now, maybe, maybe the focus becomes we need good jobs. We need high paying jobs uh, right. or we need something else. But, but that's not uh, good Lord. We don't need government to be out there, you know, creating additional high paying jobs because they're being subsidized by taking money out of middle and lower income Alaska families. If we got government that starts focusing on that. We're just making the middle and lower, we're just making the middle class uh, 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 more and more and more and more impoverished uh, by pulling money uh, out from underneath them. So it, it, it this whole argument that 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 you know I've dealt with my entire career now 
uh, on on the fiscal side of government has to create these jobs because we got unemployment. That's gone, and and right. that's a that's a big change. Yeah, no, that is a huge change, and I mean, I've argued against that whole premise for years, but now it becomes even more irrelevant because there are so many jobs available. Uh, in the private sector, but that's not going to stop them, Brad. I mean, if you think that fax is going to get in the way of their whole <laughs> mantra of job creation, I mean, come on, do you really think that that's going to be, they're going to go, oh, well, we should stop then. I mean, it, you know, because that would entail stopping the spending, right? Yeah. To, the theme of today's program may be facts don't matter or, or people oh, yeah, don't facts, matter. Yeah. Yeah. Screw your feel, screw your facts. The feelings are what matter. We feel like this is doing something great. So, I mean, that's kind of exactly what we're working with right now. Yeah. We, we feel like inflation proofing is a better, better spend of the money. So we'll create this narrative, this false narrative to yeah. support that. We think that, you know, government jobs are better than private sector jobs. So we'll create this false narrative that that we need to have the government needs to create more jobs to soak up the workforce. I, yeah, maybe so, Michael. But it, but the the fa facts do matter. Um, facts matter on the inflation proofing uh, uh, issue on the on the proposed consolidation of the of the earnings reserve and uh, and the corpus. Facts matter there. Facts matter here. The facts are we've now got we've now got more jobs and we've got people. And we don't need government adding to the problem by by you know creating more uh, creating more. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm with you hundred <clears throat> percent. Again, all these facts, Brad, they're just so painful. Nobody's going to listen to them. That's really what it's about though, Brad, right? I mean, look at this stuff. That is the theme of today's show. I mean, we're going to make the numbers fit our, our, uh, our, our, our objective. This is what we want. So let's make the numbers fit that. Oh, let's create more jobs because we have more jobs and we've got people to do it, but let's create even more jobs because that's doing something. Um, I mean, none of that stuff matters because, oh, well, you know, it's we it can it goes all back to that hubris of, well, we know better than you what you're you know, we know we know you guys, you poor, poor, pitiful kids just sit in the back corner. We'll we'll massage everything to show you exactly what we want you to see. And then we're going to do what we want anyway in the long run. That's kind of what's going on right now. Yeah, this, the thing about jobs, I mean, the only argument that's left um, about for people that want to create, you know, jobs, we need to pass a big capital budget because we need to have jobs. We need to pass, you know, old tax credits because we need jobs on the North slope. So we need to subsidize the creation of those jobs out there by taking money out of the hands of middle and lower income Alaska families. The only thing that's left, um, is, is basically from a legislator standpoint, we need to create these jobs because I want you to be dependent on me. <laughs> I want you to have to, to have to, you know, thank me. I want you to have to, you know, be a, a come a kowtow to me uh, because I, I want to be the one that controls your job as opposed to the private sector out there. So I'm going to, I'm going to continue to create jobs because I want you dependent on me. I, I don't care if it exacerbates the problem in the private sector because I want you dependent on me. Well, and we're uh, disconnected from the private sector, too, on top of that, right? I mean, on top of everything else, we're disconnected from the private sector. So what does it matter? Uh, and what you're talking about is exactly what Brian says here. You mean it pulls people from productive jobs to work in government positions? That's exactly what we're talking about. And remember, I mean, the, the whole premise of this, and you have to understand it from an intellectual standpoint, and I, I think Brad, Brad agrees with me on this, when you look at it in the long run, government is a net consumer. They do not produce anything. Now they regulate, they do some other things, but there is no production. Only the private sector, only the free market is a producer. It creates something from nothing. It creates wealth. Government consumes those things and, and it may spread the wealth, but it does not produce anything. Am I wrong, Brad? No, you're not wrong. I, I would I would change Brian's statement what you just pulled. I, I would thank you. I would change Brian's uh, statement in one regard. Pulls people from productive jobs to work in pseudo. I would say pseudo government positions because what 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 Click would tell you, for example, is all the construction budget goes to private contractors, and that and that those private contractors hire people to do the construction jobs that are that are funded by by the capital budget. So he would say it's helping out the private economy uh, by creating all these private contractor jobs. But it's really, it's pseudo government jobs, right? It's it's funded by government. The only reason those jobs are exist in that way 
is because government funded them. So, so even though they're in the private sector, they're pseudo government, government jobs. Right. And, some, well, and sometimes, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, sometimes the argument is like, we need gov more government employees because we've got, uh, because we've got, uh, uh, you know, we got, we got spare people laying around. Sometimes that sometimes, you know, better, better put, <laughs> Uh, that, that, that is the argument some people make, but the argument that I usually hear up here is, oh, we need, we need more people working on these pseudo government, uh, uh pro on these government projects. They may be in the private sector, but we need more people working on these government projects. So we need to pull money out of the, out of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts to fund these, to fund these government projects to, to employ these people. That's, that's the problem. It's not, it's not just, we need more government employees. It's we need more government directed money that controls the private right. sector. And so what Click wants is he wants people in the construction industry to say, oh, Click, you created my job. Thank you very much. And, and you know, I, I'm going to vote for you because you create jobs uh, for me. That's that's what's that's what's really going on here. So I, my only my point is we don't need to do that anymore. The private sector is creating enough jobs, too many jobs. Thank you very right. much. Uh, yeah. on its own it doesn't it doesn't need that 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 additional stimulus of government contracts out there to create even more jobs and all it does is create more government dependency again because you have whole businesses that are that are basing their entire business model on that government spend uh, i mean so it creates more government dependency and you're right i think it then does become about power oh look at me you have to come to me to ask for that money um and that is that is a very dangerous road to hoe. Uh, let's put it that way. Uh, final, final little blurb here. Anthony says the reality is basically this: government in a vacuum is an entropic system. Without feeding it resources from elsewhere, it would slowly die off and become irrelevant. You cannot create something from nothing. That's what government making jobs is, and he's one hundred percent true. It, you know, and or the jobs are short lived, or they have to keep being fed from the public coffers. We're creating a dependency society. And that's it. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. This is the third segment, and that means we're on to number three. Uh, Brad, you've been talking about this for a while, Cook Inlet Oil and Gas. What can we do? There's been a whole bunch of ideas thrown at the wall. Each one seems to be worse than the other. And now we've got a new one, which is, oh, we'll just, you know, basically give them the lease royalty free, and that'll drive them to the market. Give me, give me your thoughts on this. So DNR has proposed a new uh, a new lease form for the next Cook Inlet lease sale. Um, uh, that uh, the headlines of the article in the Alaska Beacon and now being picked up by other publications. I saw it in the ADN uh, yesterday or this morning. Uh, the headline is Alaska offering royalty free lease terms to try to sim stimulate new Cook Inlet natural gas. Uh, development. Uh, the basic article uh, is in the is in the beacon. If anybody will, just wants to find it uh, uh, quickly, and it's and it's talking about a new lease form that that they're going to go out with in the next lease sale. They're proposing to go out with in the next lease sale that that doesn't have a royalty term, not a not the typical one eighth or fifteen percent or sometimes twenty percent. The not the typical royalty term. The royalty term will be a net a, a net what's called a net profits interest. Uh, royalty and basically that royalty term is government will share in any profits at, at a certain at a certain percentage. Government will share in any profits produced from uh, any any fines and any production from the lease. Essentially, allows the companies to recover their entire costs before they have to give the government anything. That's typically what happens with taxes. I mean, that's that's what the that's what the tax code is for to to have government share in government re, achieve a, a share of the profits after uh, after expenses. Royalty is 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 a base term, typically a base term that says you will pay uh, a certain amount regardless of whether. I mean, there's 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 rental elite, rental lease rentals which is you'll pay a certain amount regardless of what you do with the lease. And if you develop the lease, you'll pay a certain amount, a share of the revenues uh, to government, uh, regardless of, uh, of whether you're making a profit or not. That's the typical, that's the typical royalty royalty term and the, and the royalty term that's used widely in the state. There are a few net profits leases on the oil side up on the North slope 
uh, in an era when we were, when DNR went off on this frolic and detour up there, but uh, mostly, uh, 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 mostly they are base, base royalty uh, leases. I think all of them, the Cook Inlet up, up until now have been, have been uh, a set royalty rate uh, uh, leases. The reason reason DNR is doing this is because obviously they're trying to incentivize uh, additional production in the uh, additional development uh, of, of natural gas resources in the Cook Inlet, given the South Central's uh, uh, gas situation. But there are uh, there are different there are other ways to do this. I mean, DNR already has the authority to reduce lease uh, reduce royalties if a producer comes in and demonstrates that the production wouldn't occur. Uh, at the current royalty rate, that the cost would be too high, the producer wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't go forward with the with the production, and and make an argument that by reducing the royalty rate to a certain amount, it will cause the producer to go ahead and develop, or cause the producer to go ahead and make the additional expenditures, the additional investment necessary to do it. So, DNR already has the authority to vary the royalty rate up and down, uh, uh, or down rather, uh, depending upon depending upon the circumstances here. What they're proposing to do is is beyond that, and just saying, "Oh, we'll, we'll, we won't charge royalty at all. We'll just go to zero from the outset, and we'll share in the profits if uh, if you produce any uh, net profits uh, from uh, from uh, subsequently from production." And I, that's just too to me. That's too far. I mean, DNR right. already has the authority to reduce royalties when it needs to. Um, it can do it on a case by case basis. In fact, in the in the same uh, Petroleum News Alaska uh, edition, this week's Petroleum News Alaska that talks about this proposal. There's another article talking about DNR agreeing to reduce the royalty rate on the steelhead uh, production platform on the oil side uh, for Hillcorp in the Cook Inlet. I mean, there's it shows that they're that they that they have the authority and are exercising the authority to reduce the royalty rate. This is sort of a race to the bottom. This is <laughs> this is we'll just give it all up. Uh, we won't we won't have any royalty. Uh, please go forward with your with your project. Right. If you ever eke out any 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 uh, uh, profits, uh, uh, we'll share in right. ten. I, please it, produce it for us. Please produce it for us. We'll give you money to produce it for us. Essentially, at this point, um, and like we said, anytime that there's a net profit tax, you know who's going to lose. That would be us. We're going to lose if there's a net profit tax because. Uh, you know, they've got a whole floor full of sharp penciled accountants and we are six years behind on the audits for the current stuff that we have already. Yeah, it's um, it, it's just a it's a I mean, I it, I'll say this. It's better than giving the producers money in the ter in, in terms of credits. It's it's better than that. At least we're not we're not taking money from middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts. And transferring it, transferring it over to producers like we are uh, on the slope with the with the credits up there. Uh, at least we're not doing that. At least it's better than that. But it's but it but it but we don't need to be. We we shouldn't be racing to the bottom by saying well we'll just give up on royalties entirely. The DNR has got enough flexibility, enough authority to address these things on a case by case basis. You know, so, so you got a producer who who makes a big find on these leases, right? Let's let's say. You know, another a pika, a Cook Inlet equivalent of pika is found uh, in the uh, in in the Cook Inlet, where they're going to make profits hand over hand over fist, um, and and basically we're saying, well, because you did it, because you happened to find it during this era that we decided not to that we had decided to have net profits leases, we don't get any royalty from it, uh, even though even though it's a huge discovery, even though it's a great thing, we don't get any royalty from it, uh, even though you don't need it. So we, we ought to, I mean, what we ought to do always is go out with royalty leases and then be clear that we're, as they have the authority to do, we're willing to negotiate the royalty down if you can demonstrate to us right. that, that you need that relief in order to, uh, in order to develop right. that project. You're just, you're giving money away. You're giving money away to people who don't need it in order to try to attract people who do need it, but you've got the authority existing authority to deal with those people who do need it anyway without giving money away to the people who don't need it. Yeah. And, it, and of course, I couldn't find anything in this article talking about this proposal for a no royalty. There's no sunset on it. It's like, as long as you have the lease, there's no, there's no, the first five years, the first 10 years, once we hit a specific area, then it changes. 
I mean, it's, it's just, here you go. Let me hand it to you on a silver platter. And, uh, you know, it, it, it makes no sense. Uh, when, like you said, if they hit a big find out there, there should be some caveat that said, okay, if you hit a certain specific thing, there should be some escalators built into it, uh, or at least a, a sunset or a timeline on this to make it happen. Yeah. Timelines. I mean, you, you, you could, you could put a timeline in, but that's, I mean, you're just really complicating things now. It, it, we, we've, we've got it all set up. We've got the authority set up to negotiate royalty reductions on an individual basis. If you can demonstrate to us that you need it and you can set, you can, you can set production limits, you can set timelines, you can set sunset provisions on all that and, and, and deal with it on a case by case basis. There's no need to give it away in blank to everybody, even if they don't need it, ultimately find something that they that they don't need royalty relief on. There's no way, there's no reason to be to have given it away in blank. So I yeah, there's there's no there's no caveats on it uh, uh, in the in the lease terms. Usually that's because it's too complicated to try that to try to layer that on. You, you layer that on in a specific case. Right. So your yeah, so your argument is create a regular lease oil royalties as it there, but tell them at the outset before the bidding starts, we'd be willing to turn these royalties way down, maybe even to zero for a period of time, but it would still be baked into the actual lease itself. Right, and you've got to demonstrate we'll be we'll be willing, and the authority's already there. I mean, it's already in the regulations, already in the statutes. We so maybe you need to you know look, hey, look at this statute over here. Um, of course, we don't. Our legislature doesn't facts. deserve statutes. I mean, so what's that's a problem. But you look at this statute over here before you submit your lease, because you know we're going to be willing to we're going to be willing to be responsive. But you got to demonstrate to us that you need it uh, before before we're willing to uh, before we're willing to exercise that. Instead of just yeah, here you go. Right. <laughs> you, you all get zero royalties. Uh, good luck. Yeah. Uh, what do you think is going to be less than two minutes here? What do you think is going to be the outcome of this if they are able to go through? Because, I mean, we're voices in the wilderness here. Nobody's listening to you and I. So, I mean, what I mean, I'm trying to be trying to be uh, realistic here. Uh, I mean, what, what, what do you think is going to happen uh, with this if it does? Do you think it's going to encourage or what do you think is going to happen? In all honesty, Michael, I think it's going to act as a windfall. To producers who were otherwise going to going to submit bids on these leases anyway, um, and and I think it's going to you know they're going to say oh well you know I did it because of these lease terms when in fact they were already looking at the prospects and uh, and evaluating whether to to bid on them to know that already knowing that the statute's there that they can negotiate down uh, if they need to so I think it's just a I think it's just a windfall profit frankly to. Uh, to those who are otherwise going to participate in any event. And the state's going to lose out on that revenue in the long run forever, essentially on those, uh, on those leases. Why aren't we in charge, Brad? I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> just, you know, why are we in charge? I mean, we could t- fix all this. It just, it makes no sense what's going on right now with all this stuff that's happening. Michael, we, we thought not that we were going to be in charge, but we thought we were going to have a governor. I mean, all this stuff, all this stuff goes back to the governor, right? Yes. Yes. The, the permanent fund board is, a, uh, unlike other permanent fund boards who have been appointed in part by prior governors and, and and the current governor, this permanent fund board now, because Dunleavy's in his second term, has been appointed entirely by entirely by uh, the current governor. Um, the arguments that some make about big cap for big capital projects, you know, that the governor has the veto pen. He can say, "Look, we're not gonna we're not gonna spend that money. It no longer makes sense." Um, to create jobs, and, right? To yeah, create jobs, and now DNR. I mean, DNR is run by a gubernatorial appointee, um, the the commissioner of uh, the Department of Natural Resources. And it's the commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources that's going out with this stuff. So, you know, we not that we were going to be in charge, but we thought we had somebody who was consistent with the way we think, who who is in charge, who was elected, you know, six years ago or five years ago, and was was reelected one year ago. But it's not turning out that way. It's turning out uh, uh, to be uh, to be a different administration than I think we thought uh, we thought we were getting. Yeah, the whole uh, permanent fund board being all Dunleavy appointees is the one that really sticks out to me and sticks in my craw that these are his people that are making these choices to bamboozle us in a way that is just um, it's offensive. It really is just offensive at this point. Final thoughts are. 
that that I, I think truth has been, you know, truth is a truth is a victim is, is, is sort of the theme of this show. Look, the permanent fund board is a problem. The permanent fund board has turned out to be a problem. This sort of this whole argument about consolidating the earnings reserve account and and the corpus is is an effort, I think, to 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 manipulate uh, the public. The facts they're using is an effort to manipulate the public in a way to uh, to support uh, that board uh, proposal, and and I think that leads us in the wrong direction. As I as you and I have talked about on the show, as you've talked about a number of times, all that does is set up the set up the ability to drain the corpus down. As I wrote last week in the column, down to zero potentially by, by 2050. Um, all this does is set up the, all the, the argument about the inflation proofing does is set up the argument to continue to drain the permanent fund dividend. So it's, it's a real disappointment. What the board's up to is a real disappointment. And as I said on the show last week, and, and we'll keep saying, I think it's time to look at sunsetting the board and, and restructuring the board in a way that gives us a much more professional outcome. Yeah, I mean, what gets me is the disingenuousness of what they're doing. And then, of course, the other thing that infuriates me that I talked about last week was James Brooks just kind of complicity in this. I mean, you know, you're James has always written, I thought, very usually very well. And usually he has some kind of, you know, balancing in there and everything else. But at this point, he's just completely parroting the narrative that's coming out of Bert Stedman and the Permanent Fund Board at this point. Well, there's not, there's not anybody... I mean, maybe Rob will step up or Shower will step up or others will step up and talk about it from a, uh, or Ben will step up and talk about it from a legislative standpoint. James usually will will do balance when a legislator is talking about the other side of the issue. Maybe they'll step up and start talking about this issue. But uh, uh, yeah, right now he's just, he is. All, all he's doing is parroting what the Permanent Fund Board is saying. And if he goes for for a diversity quote, it's or to Stedman, who's 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 in the same lockstep. Stedman, who's the author of the two four billion dollar ad hoc uh, contributions to the permanent or to the inflation proofing that 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 has put it in an excess position. So, um, well, and that I, I, that chart really lays out, you know, where we are and why we are where we are. That's the, the that chart is says it all pretty much. Yeah, well, it'll be the it'll be the as I said, this is a preview. It'll be the 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 base chart in uh, this coming week's landmine column. So, if anybody wants to grab back back at it, it's uh, it's either on Twitter yesterday or it'll be in the landmine column uh, on Friday. Yeah, I'll drop a link to the chart <clears throat> right now. Here, let me just drop a link to this chart in the chat room so folks can go take a look at it. All right, well, Brad, thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to next week, and uh, we'll see what. Uh, We'll see what transpires between now and then. Should be an interesting time as we get closer to the, st the start of the session. It's already jenning up. You can see the things already starting to work up. All right, Brad, thanks so much. I appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.